Everybody ready? <laughs> All right. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the 11th annual John Paul Stevens Lecture. I am, for those of you who don't know me, Lolita Buckner Ennis. Um, I am the, I believe, 17th Dean of the University of Colorado Law School. Um, I am in my second year of service here, and let me tell you, it has been wonderful every second. This lecture is sponsored by Colorado Law's Byron R. White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law under the directorship of Suzette Malveaux, who is the Moses Lasky Professor of Law, as well as being director of the White Center. Professor Malveaux is a nationally recognized expert on civil rights law and complex litigation. Her wide-ranging expertise, cutting-edge scholarship, and her commitment to innovative teaching and public service enriches the Colorado law community, the state of Colorado, our nation, and indeed the world. We are so very happy to have her. The White Center, which was founded through the generous bequest of Colorado law alumnus Ira C. Rothgerber, Jr., serves as the cornerstone of Colorado law's public service program. It engages law students, lawyers, judges, and community members in our nation's constitutional conversation. And need I say, more than ever, that conversation is important and vital for all of us. Additionally, this year's lecture is brought to you in partnership with Colorado Law's American Law, Indian Law Program, directed by Kristen Carpenter, who is the Council Tree Professor of Law. The American Indian Law Program at Colorado Law provides students with extensive opportunities to study indigenous people's law, while also gaining practical experience through the American Indian Law Clinic, through externships at the Native American Rights Fund and tribal governments, and our international projects, such as those uh, conducted through the United Nations. As we gather, we honor and acknowledge that the University of Colorado Law School and indeed, the entire University of Colorado uh, campus here at Boulder is on traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Ute peoples. Further, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that comprise what is now called the state of Colorado. This year, Colorado law students are working on legal issues with several of these tribes, and we are grateful for the trust that they placed in us. We hope to be worthy of that trust. It is absolutely wonderful to see all of you here engaged with this endeavor, members of the community, members of the university, and beyond, also including leaders of the American Indian law community, the Colorado law faculty, staff, students, members of the federal and Colorado judiciary, Colorado elected officials, and other esteemed members of our community far and wide, as that is defined. Given our virtual platform, we are also very fortunate to be able to welcome legal scholars and practitioners from all over the world. This year, we are very much privileged to welcome Angela R. Riley, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation of Oklahoma and Professor of Law at the University of California, Los Angeles, my JD alma mater, got to get in a shout out for UCLA, an internationally esteemed jurist and scholar, Justice Riley became the youngest person and the first woman to be elected as Justice of the Supreme Court of the Citizen Potawatomi elect, uh, Nation. She is special advisor to the Chancellor on Native American and Indigenous Affairs. She directs UCLA School of Law's Native Nations Law Program and Policy Center, as well as the JD MA Joint Degree Program in Law and American Indian Studies. Justice Riley's lecture will mark the first time, the very first time, that a justice of the High Court of an Indigenous Nation has delivered this prestigious lecture, and Colorado Law is extremely proud to welcome her. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Professor Suzette Malveaux and Justice Angela Riley. And before I do, please join me in giving them a very warm welcome.
Thank you, Dean, I appreciate that. Um, thank you to all of you for coming out on a random Tuesday night. <laughs> um, it is a busy time for the students. I know it's midterms, there's a lot going on, so I really appreciate your being here. Um, I'm honored to have uh, so many people here tonight for this, uh, for this uh, lecture and this event, so many tribal leaders, lawyers, scholars, community members, and colleagues. So, so I'm excited. Um, thank you so much to Justice Riley for being here. We are really thrilled and honored to have you. I think this is an especially important conversation to have given the assaults on our democracy today. So I'm very much looking forward to your insights, Justice Riley. I am also really grateful that the White Center has partnered this year with the American Indian Law Program to have this conversation. So my partner in crime, Professor Kristen Carpenter, I couldn't be more thrilled to be working with uh, this year. All right, first, let me start with a couple of housekeeping matters uh, and then we'll jump into the conversation. Um, tonight's discussion is going to be in a fireside chat format. So Justice Riley will be discussing uh, Native nations as the third sovereign within the legal framework of the United States. We'll be exploring the role of the courts in ensuring justice in Indian country. That fireside chat is gonna be followed by a Q&A from law students who have submitted questions in advance. Um, and afterwards, we are going to welcome everyone who's in person to join Justice Riley out in Betcher Hall for a reception, a special um, sort of event immediately following the lecture. So we hope to, you will have time to ask your own questions and sort of engage with the justice. For those of you who are joining us uh, virtually by webinar, your cameras and audio are automatically turned off. Uh, virtual participants should use the chat function only to let us know if you're having any tech difficulties and the IT folks will come and assist you. There is also gonna be a recorded version of the webinar that is available later um, this week. So you're welcome to check that out. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Justice Riley, if I could welcome you to the Fireside Chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is just us in a living room with a couple hundred people out there, no worries. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and just start with our topic today. Um, we know that Justice Sandra Day O'Connor about 25 years ago published an article in the Tulsa Law Review talking about the third sovereign. And so I'm wondering, what do you mean when you say Indian tribes are um, the third sovereign within the legal framework of the United States? What are we talking about? Well, first of all, bonjour, hello. Can, nice to see you all, thank you for being here. Um, when I say the third sovereign, I, I, I mean it in exactly the way that, it's, uh, that, it's, that it sounds. Um, in the United States, of course, we know that we have the federal courts, we know that we have the state courts, um, but many people don't know that we also have tribal courts and that tribal governments are, in fact, uh, sovereign nations who operate and run their own governments and have their own tribal court systems, um, which are essential to administering justice and keeping peace and safety and security um, and resolving disputes and all the things that courts do, tribal courts do uh, in tribal communities. And um, it, it's, I know Colorado does a wonderful job. None of you are gonna graduate without knowing that tribal courts, um, that tribes are the third sovereign, but many, many people actually are unaware of tribal sovereignty. And um, it's, it's a key feature of tribal self-determination. Right, thank you, thank you. Um, in our audience today, as I mentioned before, we have experts. We have American legal, American um, Indian um, lawyers. We have scholars. We have people who are experts in the field who have been working um, for years uh, on these sorts of matters. Um, and at the same time, in our audience, we also have people who don't have any information. We're learning for the first time about Indian courts, about tribal sovereignty. Uh, and that's in large part, I think, because of our educational system. Um, can you tell us, just kind of give us a primer, a little bit about what tribal courts do, um, what kind of cases do they hear, and um, how much do they vary amongst each other? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, tribal courts are as varied as tribes themselves. There are 574 federally recognized Indian tribes in the United States, um, which may be a surprising number to some of you, maybe not to others. Um, and there are around 400 tribal inst uh, justice institutions at work in the United States today. Um, and they are on a huge spectrum. Uh, I can give you an example. Some tribes um, use tribal institutions to resolve disputes where um, procedures and policies and laws may not be written down. They may be passed orally. Um, some things, some pieces of information may be kept only by particular members of the community. Um, some of those re uh, conflicts might be resolved by a panel of elders or spiritual or religious leaders. And then on the complete other end of the spectrum, um, you can see tribes that have tribal courts that would very much emulate what you see in the state or federal system um, with an adversarial model, with um, all the bells and whistles of you know, uh, court reporters and transcripts and defense attorneys um, and district court and appellate courts of various levels. Uh, my own tribe actually has, we have a district court and then we have a Supreme Court. So we're, we're the one and only appellate level uh, mm -hmm. in my tribe. So really um, there's a wide array. And I, I should also say that tribal courts also, depending on the tribe's specific needs, will tailor its court to what its particular objectives are or what's a good fit for its community. So some tribal, some tribes I've seen, for example, might, um, might only want to deal with family law matters. So they might have a court that only deals with family law. Um, some tribal courts might be set up specifically to deal with um, criminal matters, but with diversion programs or culturally appropriate punishments that um, are intended to avoid the carceral system. So you'll see all kinds of things. We have peacemaking courts and wellness courts. Um, so there's really an enormous variety in Indian country. It's, it's as varied as the tribes themselves, really. Wow. Um, we know that the notion of sovereignty is an incredibly important concept to, uh, uh, to Indian tribes. What role would you say tribal courts play in sovereignty and self-determination? Well, I mean, I think it's at the heart of it, really. I, um, you know, I actually do a lot of work on tribal law in addition to federal Indian law and international law. And um, tribal courts apply tribal law. And so the law that's being applied in a tribal court is the law of the tribe itself. And that is, by its very nature, the essence of sovereignty. The process of lawmaking, of deciding as a community what you value, what you um, prioritize, what you want to protect, where property rights fall, who holds them, where sacred knowledge is, who holds it. All of those things are embodied in tribal law. And so tribal courts um, are the ones that enforce tribal law. Mm -hmm. So they're really at the core of self-determination. And I think, you know, it's no surprise that one of the key efforts of the United States in terms of trying to undermine tribal sovereignty historically was to criminalize tribal courts mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. it's a great line of attack if you want to um, make tribes uh, less empowered. And so, um, yeah, so I think it really goes to the heart of it. And, and the way I think about it is we do still have some vestiges of federal control in tribal courts in the U.S. Um, to varying degrees, not really very much anymore. But at the time when the federal government first destroyed, essentially, or dismantled tribal legal systems, it put its own legal systems in place. So for tribes now to really have, to be, to be able to push out the federal systems and have their own systems, um, I think is really at the heart of sovereignty. Thank you. Um, I think also this notion of tribes, probably people haven't, but as you mentioned, there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. Most people are not going to be familiar with that. And I think most Americans are not taught sort of the true history um, in our country of how the continent was settled. Um, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions about tribes, and what are some of the most important things that we should know about sovereign nations? Well, this is interesting to me because, you know, growing up in Oklahoma, and Oklahoma has a very troubled history when it comes to it, mm -hmm. Native people, mm -hmm. which you probably are well aware of. Um, but you can't grow up in Oklahoma and not know that there are Indian tribes. There are 39 federally recognized Indian tribes in the state of Oklahoma. Um, most of the tribes in Oklahoma aren't from there. Most, like mine, were removed there um, at the end of a, the barrel of a gun and, um, and took reservations in Oklahoma by treaty in the late 1800s. Um, so even if you, um, whatever your view is of Indian tribes, you know that they exist. 
So when I went to law school on the East Coast, it was so surprising to me that so many people I encountered, many of whom were from the East Coast, um, thought that all Indians were, were dead, that um, mm -hmm. all Native mm -hmm. people had been wiped out either mm -hmm. by genocide or disease, and there were no tribes left. Um, then I moved to California, and everyone that I met only thought that tribes were just these small groups of families that had casinos. Um, <laughs> those were the two, the two contrasting <laughs> views that I, that I saw. And, and of course, both are, are deeply, deeply flawed um, and, and not in any way capture the true essence of contemporary tribal governments. Um, and what do I think people should know about tribal governments? I mean, I teach a class at the Kennedy School at, at Harvard every January um, with one of my own mentors, Joe Kalt, um, called Native Nation Building, and we really focus a lot on contemporary tribes. And um, it's really amazing to see what Indian tribes across the country are doing. People might be surprised to know, for example, in many places, Indian tribes are the largest employer in the county where they are. This is true of my own tribe. Um, they employ Indians and non-Indians alike. Um, tribes engage in all forms of economic development. They are sovereign governments, so we have oh, <laughs> we have uh, our own police forces. We have our own court systems. We have um, all the all the features that you would see of a government. Um, tribes have, and but there's a particular thing though that is driving tribal sovereignty and tribal cohesion, and that's tribal culture and tradition and religion and life ways. And that's really at the core of what Indian tribes are and what has basically, I think, allowed us to um, continue to survive the onslaught of colonization. And that, that piece of it is always there. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I, thank you for that sort of background, sort of getting us all on the same page and sort of understanding some of the, this is almost the primer, right, in tribes and in uh, the tribal courts. I want to turn our attention now to some substantive issues that are going on in Indian country today and talk a little bit more deeply about those. Um, one of the things that I know that you have worked really hard on in terms of your research and your advocacy is addressing uh, criminal jurisdiction and addressing the tremendous violence against um, indigenous women and girls. Um, many people may not be familiar with this, but I mean, just the, the, the statistics are sort of skyrocket. I mean, there are about 85% of indigenous women, Alaska Native women, um, who have been subjected to violence at some point during their lives, and over half of them have experienced uh, sexual assault. Uh, there's disproportionate, as you know, um, a disproportionate impact on Native women when it comes to assaults, when it comes to abductions, uh, rape, murder, you name it. And the difficulty that um, many Indigenous women have is sort of complicated by the fact, by some, by sort of complex jurisdictional, criminal jurisdictional issues on Indian land. Um, can you share with us a little bit about the work that you've done and what that's meant to you? Yeah, I mean, for those of you who, who have studied criminal jurisdiction in Indian country, you know, I think it used to be called a jurisdictional maze and then a morass, and I don't know what we're <laughs> headed into next. But, um, but one, of the, one of the defining features is that the Supreme Court ruled in 1978 in an infamous case called Oliphant that tribes lacked criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who committed crimes in Indian country. And that ruling um, is directly traced to what we see in part um, with both domestic abuse, um, sexual assault, and crimes in general against Native women and girls, as well as missing and murdered Indigenous women. Mm -hmm. So um, most of my work actually has been very much from the perspective um, in this area of a law professor. I've done a lot of research, and I've tried to provide the scholarly foundation to um, allow for people to continue to use my research to advance the advocacy in the field. So in 2013 and again in 2022, Congress reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act, um, which carves out a certain set of crimes um, that allows tribes, acknowledges tribes' inherent sovereignty to have criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit certain kinds of crimes, mostly related to domestic violence and sexual assault against Native women in Indian country. Um, so when, when the law was first reauthorized in 2013, there was a pilot project period of a year where three tribes in particular undertook 
um, to begin this process of prosecuting non-Indians um, for these enumerated crimes. And so I, um, I did a deep dive on those cases. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I was, got the files of every single case that was filed during that period, wow. went through all of them, figured out everything that was charged, everything that happened, what happened to the defendants, um, what was the situation of the victims, uh, and you know, wrote it up in one of those very short 100-page law review articles that I'm sure you all <laughs> love to read. Um, and, uh, and in doing so, really, you know, really highlighted what I think are um, best practices of uh -huh. Indian tribes yeah. that, um, to many people's surprise, one of the points of opposition of tribes having this jurisdiction was, would tribes always, um, you know, always rule, always convict non-Indians? Um, and in fact, no, that wasn't the case. In fact, the very first case and the only case that went to jury trial in that first year ended in an acquittal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there are so many examples of what, in my work, I've called good native governance, of the incredible sophistication of tribes and tribal courts that I think would surprise many, many people. Um, and so that's sort of been how I've tried to contribute and sort of advance the ball in protect, protecting Native women and, and girls and other vulnerable people on reservations. Right, right. And, and, and what has that meant to you, just um, as an Indigenous woman doing that work? Well, you know, um, part of it comes from my own experience uh, growing up in Indian country, growing up, um, you know, in a very, very rural part of the United States. Um, for all of my growing up life, you know, there was no 911 because there, no one had addresses. So, um, so I understand like, the remote isolation of it. I understand um, a lot of the cultural impediments. So, you know, for me, um, it's really, when I think about doing that, I think about doing it for my family. And I think about doing it for, I have two daughters who are enrolled tribal members, doing it for my daughters, doing it for my students. So it, it's very personal to me. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's amazing work, and it's really important. Um, I'd like to turn our attention to the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, maybe. <laughs> Depends on your perspective, right? Uh, let's start off with a good case, right? So sure. we know that the Supreme Court has decided a number of cases recently, um, two pivotal cases uh, that actually come out of the state of Oklahoma, your home state. And um, I'm wondering what you think these cases tell us about the direction that the court is going in when it goes when it when it um, comes to Indian law. And so let's uh, let's start with the McGirt case, right, which was decided in 2020, and then we can um, move to Casta Huerto, which was decided just two years after that, and came to some very different sort of very different um, conclusions. Um, so the McGirt case uh, that was this was a uh, I think many people sort of feel a a very powerful, if not beautiful, uh, a beautifully written case by Justice Gorsuch, um, a 5-4 decision, which was in some ways groundbreaking because the court held the United States government to its word, right, and said that we were actually going to take treaties seriously, right, that we were going to enforce the treaty and that we we're going to understand the boundaries of Indian country. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that case and the impact that it had on you and so many people who've worked so hard to just have that recognition come out of the United States Supreme Court? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the case, if, if you're not familiar, the McGirt case, um, the Supreme Court held in a 5-4 decision um, written by Justice Gorsuch um, that the reservation of the Muscogee Creek Nation in Oklahoma had not been disestablished, that it had um, basically been retained um, from the point of its treaty, despite the fact that Oklahoma had, the state of Oklahoma had tried to encroach on those reservation lands for over 100 years. Uh, the first line of the opinion of Justice Gorsuch writes, on the far end of the Trail of Tears, there was a promise. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it makes me emotional saying it now. I, I cried when I read that um, that that line because you know, growing up in Oklahoma, I never thought that I would see something like that come out of the court and actually acknowledge um, the tribes in Oklahoma. And of course, not all the tribes are similarly situated, but the five so-called five tribes in Oklahoma did have similar treaties. And so, as a consequence of McGirt, at least for criminal jurisdiction purposes, and remains to be seen for what other purposes. Mm. Um, it, most of the eastern part of Oklahoma is now very decidedly within the bounds of an Indian reservation. So um, it was a remarkable, remarkable decision. And um, 
and actually, you know, created a lot of change on the ground in Indian country that the tribes had to immediately um, respond to, although, of course, they were gearing up for the possibility during the whole, during the whole pending of the, the litigation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's so powerful what you're saying. And I'd imagine for many people in the state of Oklahoma, it was also, I guess, the immediate impact maybe was um, shocking, right? Well, one million people in the state of Oklahoma, 400,000 in Tulsa, realized that they are sitting on a reservation, right? That this is Indian country and that that treaty was actually taken seriously. So um, just a really powerful, powerful case. Uh, I hate to do this because now we're gonna <laughs> fast forward two years later and just a huge, uh, huge change. And, and, and I'm wondering what you, what you think is behind that. So the Castro Huerto case, right, which was a Justice Kavanaugh decision in 5-4, um, seems to have really pushed back on a couple hundred years of precedent, right? And, and it's a you know, well-established law um, holding that the state of Oklahoma had inherent jurisdiction um, within its borders, right? And um, I, I'm wondering how you you know, just how you respond to that. And I guess the, the, the dissent, again, Justice Gorsuch came out with a strong dissent and he quoted, uh, truly a more a historical and mistaken statement of Indian law would be hard to fathom. Yeah. So why, why did the Supreme Court get it so wrong? I mean, here it is literally two years later. Is it just, is it just a change in the composition of the court from a Ginsburg to a Amy Coney Barrett? Or is there something else that's going on there? <laughs> Well, I mean, if I could really answer that question, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd be on the other Supreme yeah. Court. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's as many of you know, in the fallout from McGirt, um, the tribes immediately had to pivot, and the layers of criminal jurisdiction changed really rapidly. And part of that meant a transfer of power from the state of Oklahoma to the tribes and the federal government. The state of Oklahoma didn't like that. Um, it very much was um, felt threatened by it, was very angry about the decision, and immediately began filing petition after petition after petition to get the Supreme Court to reverse McGirt. Um, in, in the wake of, uh, you know, the lack of legitimacy that the court would have, although big question mark on that, but the lack of legitimacy that the court would have if they actually reversed the McGirt decision two years after, the court declined to do that, but it did take a smaller issue from the case, which was to ask whether states had actually retained criminal jurisdiction in Indian country despite the passage of the General Crimes Act. So for 200 years, um, it's been understood that the state has no criminal jurisdiction in Indian country um, absent an explicit uh, act of Congress like Public Law 280, and that criminal jurisdiction in Indian country, um, if it involves an Indian, either as a defendant or a victim, it's tribal and federal. And this is the scenario that tribes want, in part because the states, like the state of Oklahoma, have actually not acted very often on behalf of Indians and Indian tribes. They have not been trying to make Indian country safer for Indian people. And so um, by the court sort of throwing out 200 years of precedent, and by the way, this doesn't just apply in Oklahoma, any any tribe in the United States that was mm -hmm. um, arranged this way now has to reconfigure or think about what criminal jurisdiction is going to look like. Um, but it did something bigger than that in that it suggests that, that states have sovereignty, have an, an inherent retained sovereignty even within Indian country. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is um, a principle that has been rejected by the court um, you know, since the country's inception. So it was a pretty radical case. Yeah, yeah, and it makes, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's almost like whiplash, right? I mean, two years after the McGirt case to get something like that to come back uh, so opposite, right, in terms of the, another direction. Um, I'd like us to turn to the, the docket today, right? This, there are a number of cases that the Supreme Court is considering. Um, and think about the Brackeen case of, uh, that's pending and apparently oral argument is right around the corner. Um, yeah. So in that case, the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act is being challenged, or ICWA. Um, the court's looking at the constitutionality, looking at whether or not Congress has exceeded its authority, um, which is a little scary because ICWA, as you know, is sort of the gold standard um, for um, how child welfare procedures um, go for children who are in the system. And uh, many of my, uh, my CIPRO students are out there, and we talk about... Um, the transubstantivity of procedural, of the federal rules of civil procedure, 
This, in fact, is an example, an excellent example of how uh, procedural transubstantivity is actually not ideal <laughs> because Indian children and families are getting better procedure, right? That we have a statute that is designed to protect Indian children from being removed from their homes, um, which has been government policy for, as you know, for years and years and years. Every day we hear a little bit more about what's happened to Indian children who are at boarding schools or who adopted and so forth. It's pretty, pretty tragic. So. I'm wondering what you make of the fact that the court is looking at the constitutionality of ICWA. Um, what does that tell you going forward? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, all I should just say, as a matter of federal Indian law, um, ICWA is absolutely constitutional and could withstand an equal protection challenge because um, under the principles of federal Indian law and American constitutional law, um, from the point of inception of the United States, it's been acknowledged that Indian tribes are political entities, not racial entities. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. political tri being a tribal citizen is a specific category. You're an enrolled member of a political nation called an Indian tribe. Um, and so it's, it's not racially defined. And if you look at how the United States has made treaties with Indian nations, engaged with Indian nations across hundreds of years, this has been always been acknowledged. Um, what's troubling about the Brackeen case is the extent to which it seems that this court is eager to conflate Indianness with race. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we see that in some of the court's other opinions, like adoptive couple versus baby girl. Um, and so that really um, misses the mark for what's happened in uh, the, for the past 200 years. Um, the whole body of Indian law is based on the concept that the federal government has a unique relationship to the Indian tribes. Right. And part of it was fulfilling the trust obligation that the United States has itself acknowledged that it owes to Indian tribes. Um, so, so there's, um, you know, I'm not one to predict what's going to happen in, uh, in the Supreme Court, but um, I certainly have uh, a bit of pessimism that the court is going to adhere to these well-settled principles. And I think as we've seen in the court's recent decisions, they are willing to jettison well-settled precedent um, in cases that they um, do not want to see continued forth. Um, and I think that's a scary proposition for us. Okay, uh, we'll see, right? We'll see. We'll see. November we'll see. 9th is the oral argument, so. <laughs> um, I wanna shift gears to maybe um, something more, per maybe more personal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think about your background, you shared a little bit about um, your background. Uh, how does that shape or impact your, um, your perspective on the bench? or even sort of make, enhance your qualifications as a chief justice of a tribal court? Well, you know, it's interesting. So as I mentioned, I grew up in a very rural part of Oklahoma. I lived on a farm for 20 years that was 20 miles from the nearest gas station. Um, I had around 18 people in my graduating class. Um, so very small rural community. I grew up, you know, butchering chickens and hoeing cotton and all that <laughs> stuff, um, for real, for real. And, um, and so, uh, so, you know, there are, in Oklahoma, there's nothing unusual about my background at all. Um, I also grew up, you know, quite poor. Um, but when I went to law school, I realized there weren't a lot of people at Harvard Law School who actually grew up, you know, <laughs> butchering chickens and castrating hogs and doing all those other fun things. Um, and, and as a professor, also, very few of my colleagues have that kind of shared background. Right. Um, so I, I think all of that combined with the fact that I grew up smack dab in the middle of of on a farm in, in what was formerly the Kiowa Comanche Apache Reservation. I grew up with many Kiowa people and um, am a tribal member myself. Um, my sister and mother live in tribal housing on our tribe's treaty lands um, and have for you know, well over a decade. So, you know, I think having that life experience um, brings something to the table, I hope, um, being a, a tribal court justice that, um, that is some value added beyond you know, someone who just has an intellectual interest in it or may know a lot about Indian law. I mean, for me, it's very personal mm -hmm. and difficult oftentimes because sometimes we know the people, um, we know the parties, and, um, and, and, and it touches every part of our lives. My sister works for the tribe and lives there. Um, so, so it's very intimately connected. And, and I like to think that I bring, hopefully, context and empathy um, to the cases that mm -hmm. I hear. Yeah, I think that's really important. That's, um, that's really, that's great. Um, that's my last question okay. before we turn to the, to the student questions. And I just 
um, ask you to think about the future for a minute. Um, I think about the next generation, right? I think about sort of young indigenous people today. I think about my daughter, she's a member of the Cherokee Nation. I think about some of our indigenous students. Uh, are you optimistic about the future of, um, are you, of, of Native Americans and uh, Native nations? Any advice that you would give um, indigenous students and young people in general? Yeah, well, you know, it's. I have two teenage daughters, as I mentioned, who are also tribal members, and I see the things that they um, are going through, and, and many of you are close to that age yourselves. Um, you know, it's a challenging time. Uh, they've seen their, their reproductive rights essentially taken away, um, at least their constitutional right. Um, the issues around uh, racial injustice and climate change and wealth inequality, all of the things um, that they're sort of encountering as young people are really overwhelming. Um, at the same time, I am very optimistic, and I'm optimistic about Indian tribes um, in particular, and I think the, the number, I will say two reasons. One, we're still here. The whole plan was to make sure that we weren't here by now. It was all, we were all, we were supposed to go away a long time ago. Um, the reservation system was supposed to be sort of a temporary holding pattern until Indians either died off or assimilated. But tribes are still here, and Indians take the long view. You know, Indian mm. tribes are living and acting and governing on behalf of the next, of seven generations after them. So the United States can kind of do what it's gonna do, the court can do what it's gonna do, but I think tribes are going to still be here, and I think that resilience has been demonstrated for, you know, hundreds or thousands of years. Um, so so I, I am optimistic about that. Um, in terms of advice, you know, I think it's interesting, and again, I see this in my own kids. Um, the young people today, many of you are out here, um, you're the most sophisticated uh, group uh, generation in the history of the world. You have the power of information in your pocket. Some of you have probably been checking it while I've been talking. <laughs> um, you can get information at a moment's notice about almost anything. You have unbelievable access, power, sophistication, knowledge. Um, but what I see a lot is that even with that, there's a temptation to just sort of swipe your way through life, you know, to scroll your way through Instagram or swipe your way through TikTok or swipe your way through Bumble or whatever it is <laughs> and think about there's always something better. There's always some, there's something else that might catch my attention. And I guess what I would say my advice would be um, I don't think that's a recipe for a life that, um, that will be fulfilling and that will have value. I think that um, what you really, for a life of value, in my opinion, um, is to commit. Commit to something, believe in something, really invest in something, um, whatever that is, but really go deep and put your heart into it. Um, because the superficial, like the next best thing is just around the corner, um, I think will um, ultimately end in not, not being a very fulfilling existence. Um, so that's the advice I give my own children when they are on TikTok at the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> I will pass that on to my daughter. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks. Okay, we are actually going to invite at this time some of those young people um, to join us for this conversation. We have um, six students um, who have submitted questions, and those questions have been selected and will be um, have the opportunity to ask the justices questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and start those introductions. Um, first, I'd like to have Michelle Manso come uh, to the podium. Michelle is a 2L from Dallas, Texas. She currently serves as a co-president of the Black Law Students Association. She's a student attorney in the American Indian Law Clinic, and she has spent her semester working on voting access for Native Americans in the upcoming midterm. So Michelle, thank you for being here, welcome. Thank you, Professor Malvo, and thank you, Justice Riley, for being here. Um, so my question is um, centered on the new ABA standard um, 303C, which now requires that ABA accredited law schools like CU Law um, provide education to law students about um, bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism. Um, so my question for you is, how can schools incorporate American Indian law and more narrowly tribal law into um, our legal education? Great, thank you for that question. Um, well, I mean, as I mentioned before, I think that um, your law school actually does a very good job of, of introducing you to these principles. Um, but in general, I, I think one thing is, I think about Indian law um, the same way I would think about American law, which is that you know it's horizontal, not vertical. In other words, anything you wanna do can be done through Indian law. 
taxation, gaming, civil rights, criminal jurisdiction. So Indian law really touches um, on every single area of law that impacts Indian tribes. Uh, so I think that there are really intuitive ways for it to be introduced. It takes a little bit of um, a little bit of courage, a little bit of intellectual curiosity. I know not all my colleagues are probably really interested in integrating Indian law, but I think it can be done fairly um, fairly simply. And, and I will just add, I'm also a property professor. I teach 1L property, and I've always started my my class with Johnson versus McIntosh, the doctrine of discovery case. And um, when I first started teaching, I was also much younger. But when I first started teaching, many of my students said to me you know, why are we learning this like sort of niche thing about Indians? Why aren't we learning the real law that all the other students are learning in their property class? Um, and, you know, I've been teaching a long time and now my students, I teach Johnson versus Macintosh, not only appreciate me teaching it, but say um, that they've approached their other professors to try to understand why they don't teach it. How can we actually have a property class that doesn't talk about Johnson versus Macintosh and the doctrine of discovery? So I think that, um, I think legal education's changing, students are changing, and with it, I think those of us in the academy are changing, and, and, and I think that there is an interest in integrating Indian law into that, and, and I think that there are, are ways to do it, and I'm, I'm optimistic about that as well. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like our next student to come up, uh, Adam Fisher. Adam is a 2L who is currently serves on the Colorado Law Review, the Environmental Law Society, and he's a part of the American Indian Law Program. He spent 14 years working in the outdoor industry and plans to practice public lands law. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Justin Trowley, so much for joining us. Um, in preparing for this lecture, I learned that the Citizens Ottawa Nation um, ratified its current constitution in 2007, and that was very interesting to me. And I'm curious to know how this new constitution affected the Yes, well, I mean, I have to give credit to my tribal chairman, who I think is a visionary, um, Chairman Rocky Barrett, who's been our chairman for decades. Um, really, like many tribes, not just in Oklahoma, but many tribes in the US, um, we had a, a big movement of people from our reservation base in Oklahoma to other places. Um, for us, a big part of it was the Dust Bowl, um, and then subsequent, the relocation. So as a result, we have a lot of Potawatomis who don't live in Oklahoma, although the majority do, and the majority live around our treaty territory in Shawnee. So um, my tribal chairman wanted to create a legislative system where there would actually be representation in our legislature of the Potawatomis who were outside of the state of Oklahoma. And that took, um, probably took about 10 years of him um, explaining the process and what it would mean um, and, and really explaining to the people in Oklahoma that they would always still have a majority, that the, they would always have the majority of power. So there would never be a balance, an imbalance of power for out of Oklahoma Potawatomis. Um, and I think it's been remarkable to um, re-engage the um, citizenry of the tribe. Um, people feel like they have a voice. There are certain things that you can access and benefit from if you're a Potawatomi who's out of state as well as in state. And one of the other really key features of our, co of our constitutional reform was to get the provision of our constitution that required approval of the Secretary of the Interior to change our constitution out of our constitution. And we did. <laughs> um, yes, I know, right? <laughs> So, um, so, so those are some of the some of the things that happened in our constitutional reform. I think it really made us stronger. Also, really concretized a separation of powers um, for us that I think was really key to our leadership. Great, thank you. Uh, my next, the next student is Davy Jaw. Uh, Davy is a one L from St. Louis, Missouri. He's also in my class. Yay! <laughs> Davy's currently involved in the Corey Weiss Innocence Project and the National Lawyers Guild. He's particularly interested in criminal defense and labor law. Thanks, yeah. Katie. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today, Chief Justice Riley. Uh, my question is, how would you measure justice for indigenous people in Oklahoma? What are some important milestones that have been reached? And in light of the discussion about um, McGirt, McGirt um, is this one of those milestones? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, you know, as I mentioned, um, most of the tribes in Oklahoma were removed there. It's not our Aboriginal homeland. Um, and in addition to the reservation system, once we got our reservations, then our reservations were allotted and most of that land went to non-Indians. Our reservations were broken up. Um, many, many children taken to boarding schools, the process of assimilation, the, the mass uh, murder of the buffalo very intentionally to sort of starve Indians into submission in many cases, policing reservation borders so we could no longer move about freely, hunt, gather, et cetera, um, really putting us under the thumb of the United States in a very profound way. Um, given that that was the situation we were in, criminalizing our tribal governments, given that that's a situation that we were in, you know, in the early 1900s, and looking where tribes are today, I would say, to the, I would say tribes have achieved an enormous amount of milestones in the state of Oklahoma, but not due to anybody but themselves. The tribes have re been absolutely resilient, maintained their culture, maintained who they are as tribal people, and have just pushed back against the assimilation and the effort to sort of um, annihilate them culturally and actually um, for many, many, many years. Um, and so one of the things that was so amazing in the post-McGirt world was to see tribal courts go from having a couple of dozen cases um, in a calendar year prior to McGirt to having close to a thousand cases in the year after and seeing the extent to which they scaled up, they hired prosecutors, um, got new judges and just really built, and I, I got to observe some of those proceedings, um, the, the amount of flexibility, nimbleness, um, resilience, I think is just remarkable. So, uh, so tribal, I, I think Indians in Oklahoma, tribes in Oklahoma may not have achieved justice in the fullest sense, for, excuse me, for sure, um, but the trajectory is steep and it is continuing, I think, to ascend. Great, thank you. Um, our next student is Catherine Carter. Uh, Catherine is a 2L student who hails all the way from Canberra, Australia. Uh, she is involved in the Environmental Law Society, the Law School Sustainable Action Committee, and the Environmental um, Law Journal. Uh, she's interested in public land conservation and renewable energy development. Thank you for being here, Catherine. Thank you, and thank you very much for your time tonight. Um, I wanted to ask you about how the structure of many tribal courts are kind of at odds with inherent tribal values because those courts are built on the American legal system, a system that has enshrined individualistic and antagonistic legal systems and values, um, and how you as a justice kind of combat that. Um, well, I think that um, it's interesting in tribal courts to sort of see this huge range and some that are emulating, I think, state and federal systems um, and many that do not. And one of the things that I've noticed in my research, especially with criminal jurisdiction, is that a lot of what happens in Indian tribes or at least tribal institutions um, rely on federal grant funding. Um, some of that federal grant funding is tied to tribes emulating a carceral system. And so one of the things that I think tribes are doing, um, one is that the more independence they have from the federal government, the more they're able to structure their own systems um, completely independently of any sort of federal oversight. Um, and you see tribes moving away in many cases, especially in criminal jurisdiction, moving away from that model and toward more forms of um, restorative justice, peacekeeping, uh, peacemaking courts, wellness courts, treat, drug treatment for people instead of jail or prison. Um, and so when tribes actually are in the driver's seat, I think you do see in many cases a rejection of the um, external sort of federal system. Uh, so a lot of it I think has to do with self-determination and, and financial independence. So I see a lot of uh, amazing change happening in Indian country in, in those spaces. Um, I will say also though that some tribes have a model that is similar to state and federal and that's the model that they want. Mm. Um, it is their, their choice that that's the model that they want to keep and to achieve. Sometimes they allow defendants to have a choice between a traditional um, peacekeeping process and an adversarial court process and the defendants themselves get to choose and it's a consent based model. So I really see all, all varieties out there but, but tribes being in the driver's seat is the key. Great, thank you. Uh, our next student, Emiliano Salazar, is uh, 3L. He's involved in the Latinx Law Students Association, the Native American Law Students Association, and the American Law, Indian Law Clinic. 
Uh, he serves as uh, for Colorado Law School, the Vice President for National NALSA, and his interests are international human rights, indigenous peoples, and federal Indian law. Thank you for being here. Tlazo Camante. Uh, thank you, Professor Malvo and Chief Justice Riley. Uh, much of your work has revolved around large concepts like federal Indian law and international human rights. Uh, my question is, how have you been able to incorporate international human rights norms into your jurisprudence, and how has it helped you to make decisions for your tribe? Thank you. Um, well, a long, long time ago, when I was a law student um, <laughs> at Harvard and wanted to take a class in international, indigenous peoples and international law, and Harvard offered no such class, um, I wrote a letter with Professor Kristen Carpenter, and we went and sat in the dean's office and, and, uh, and <laughs> demanded such a thing be taught. And you know what? It was, and Professor Jim Anaya was invited to come in and teach that class, so I learned from the person who literally wrote the book, so I'm gonna say that. <laughs> um, so thank you, Jim. Um, so really, my interest began, I think, then, and has grown over the years. The field has changed tremendously. Um, Professor Carpenter and I have worked extensively but in the UN system in a variety of, of ways. Um, one, one thing, just, just to give one high point, I think, is that um, during the pandemic, um, the University of Colorado, the Native American Rights Fund, and uh, UCLA Law School all got together and put together what we called the Tribal Implementation Toolkit, which is essentially, a, it's both an online document and a physical document that actually talks about how to implement the principles of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into tribal law. Um, under the leadership of people like John Echo Hawk and Walter Echo Hawk and others, um, we were inspired to say, well, why not start with tribes first? We're not going to get the United States, at least not today, to adopt the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but tribes can be the leaders in this. Again, achieving justice on our own, being the model, being good Native governments. Um, and so we put together that toolkit, and we've seen tribes, not just the tribes we highlight in that document, but tribes since then, who are themselves actually being leaders in really putting into law um, the international indigenous rights. And, and I think it's an incredible, an incredible moment, and it's just the beginning, um, or maybe the middle, of a really long movement um, that's moving in the right direction, I think. Great, thank you. Um, our last student, Hannah Aders. Uh, Hannah is a 1L student. She's involved in the Native American Law Students Association, the Environmental Law Society, uh, the Colorado Law Student Parent Group, she is a proud member of the Coquel Indian Tribe, where she serves on the Culture and Education Committee and Child Care Task Force. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Professor Thank you, Professor and um, My question is, how do you envision to colonize justice system, and how could it be in integrated into the U.S. court system? Wow. Well, you know, I think that the first step in my, and this is again in my experience working with tribes in the U.S. and indigenous peoples around the world, um, the first step, of course, is to decolonize ourselves, mm. right? To look critically at our own institutions, at our own governments, um, at our own um, sort of values and life ways, um, and to and to really take control and again be a self-determining people and think about what we want. And some tribes have not had enough opportunity to do that because of so many years the tribes have been on the brink of really just trying to put one foot in front of the other. And we are now, I think, increasingly seeing the ability of tribes to do that. And that, again, ties into the restorative justice models, the non-carceral models, peacemaking, all of those things um, that are tribal custom and tradition that are being given life in tribal communities. That's the essence of decolonizing. Um, and I really think that there's a bigger story to that. Um, part of it is um, involves you as young people and really understanding and connecting yourself. I saw this especially during Standing Rock um, when Professor Carpenter and I were out at the Standing Rock Reservation in the No Dapple movement and really seeing people, indigenous people, not just from across the United States, but from across the world, united in a collective understanding that all indigenous peoples have so many common stories and, um, and, and instances of discrimination and maltreatment, and that there is a collective growing global indigenous rights movement um, that is very much being led by young people and partially through the thing that you have in your pocket because your technology allows you to be in conversation with people from all over the globe. Um, so that, I think, is um, a feature of decolonizing, and I think that um, with your help, the young people, um, I think that we'll continue to see that. 
Great, thank you. And I want to thank the students who, I mean, as you can hear, these questions are fantastic. So I'm going to just give a round of applause for our, the absolutely. Um, we're in good shape, this next generation. Um, so we are so thrilled um, for your participation and for your words and your inspiration and your brilliance. So thank you for your time. Uh, I know that we have, um, I think we now have Professor Carpenter and our NOSA leadership would like to share something with you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, it's so great to see all of you here. It's been a long time since we filled the courtroom. Um, and I sincerely want to thank Chief Justice Riley for being here and sharing your time with us and Professor Melvo for um, her leadership and vision around this event. Um, I am Kristen Carpenter. I'm the director of the American Indian Law Program here. And together with my American Indian Law Program colleagues, Professors Jim and Aya, and Christina Stanton, um, Emeritus faculty Rick Collins and Charles Wilkinson, our American Indian Law Program fellow Ellie Thurston, um, and others. Um, we also want to, want to welcome this audience um, and thank you all for your attention to these um, important issues. In many American Indian tribes and organizations, we have a tradition of honoring people um, with a gift after they've contributed something special. Um, and we're going to have a, a small honoring here tonight. And to help me with that, I would like to call up the Native American Law Students Association leadership. Um, Kelby Welsh, a 3L, is NALSA president and a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. She's together with Sienna Kalina, who is a 3L and citizen of the Osage Nation, as well as the president of National NALSA, I should say. And then Josh um, Bertolato is a 2L and vice president of our NALSA, as well as a citizen of the Tunica Biloxi tribe. And Milo Salazar is a 3L of Mexican indigenous heritage. Um, and the, are you the treasurer? No, you're the secretary. They're, and they're all literally leading national NALSA. So it's really the, the local and, and um, uh, national leadership that you have before us, and I'm so, so proud of these students. Um, so Chief Justice Riley, um, we would like to present you with this blanket, if you would be willing to stand, in honor of your tremendous accomplishments, leadership, and service to Indigenous peoples, as well as the gifts of time and wisdom and inspiration that you've bestowed on us tonight. Um, as I know from our many decades of friendship and collaboration, we were actually law school roommates together and students of Professor Anaya. Um, so we go way back. Um, Professor Riley has spent her whole life dedicated to Indian country. And we're really grateful as the American Indian Law Program and NALSA um, to share this stage with you tonight and this pathbreaking um, event with you as well. So thank you very, very much. If, if I could actually ask you to, to remain standing and students remain where you were next to Professor Riley. Um, Professor Malvo, you're going to have to forgive me, but we have a bit of a surprise for you. Oh. I know surprises might not be your thing not because you're so carefully <laughs> <laughs> prepared at all not times. Prepared. But we were so touched oh, no. by your vision to include indigenous peoples and tribal courts um, in the Stevens oh. Lecture reaching out to our community, um, making these institutional commitments to diversity and inclusion real, um, that we would like to honor you with this <laughs> gift from our community as well. Um, and I wonder if you might all move this way. Um, I'm always very bossy, so that we could take um, a, a really nice picture with our two honored guests in the middle and the students on um, the sides. We really love our students at Colorado Law, and you can see um, why. They're just really spectacular. In just a moment, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Professor Malvo. Thank you. Wow. Oh. 
Oh, thank you. You guys are gonna make me cry. This was beautiful, and this was a huge surprise. Um, so I just wanted to thank Justice Riley again for the, such an engaging discussion, and the audience for joining us today. Um, it's been an incredible evening, really. Uh, and I wanna thank so many people here because it does take a village. So give me a moment to thank my villagers. Uh, we are, are quite the team. Uh, many, it looks like a lot of my team is sitting up there. So let me start thanking them. First, thanking the Dean, Lolita Buckner Innes, for her tremendous support. We really appreciate this. Um, and the people have worked really hard on the ground to make this happen. Uh, Lindley Bell, Yesenia Delgado, Ellie Thurston, Robin Munn, Nicole Much, and Kelly Ilsang. So I'm so grateful for your very, very hard work. Um, I wanna thank the White Center Fellows, the students who have worked hard to make this real. Uh, Madeline Shalafu Jin, uh, Tia Nelson, Michaela Calhoun, Francesca Deguet, Essence Duncan, and Charlie Goodno. So thank you to uh, thank you to my fellows. I so appreciate their work. Um, I do want to thank the NALSA leadership for uh, your uh, your participation and being not only local leadership but national leadership. So we uh, we are looking forward to you, the next generation, and there's so much to look forward to and see what you do next. Um, I do want to thank the IT folks that always make us look great. Um, Teresa Coberly in particular, she did a fabulous job. And, and the folks back there, yes, you should. I'm sorry I don't know some of the names of the folks back there, but mm -hmm. definitely shout out to you guys. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, thank a big shout out and thank you to my uh, colleague and partner in crime, Professor Kristen Carpenter, the director of the American Indian Law Program. Uh, so it was great to have somebody to, uh, to be in the trenches with on such an important event. Um, so at this point, I'm just gonna make a couple of um, housekeeping uh, statements for you. Um, later this week, you will receive a recording to tonight's lecture. Uh, you'll also get a survey. We really do want you to fill it out. Uh, you don't have to put five stars, it's okay. I won't get in trouble. <laughs> um, we really do want your thoughts, right? So please give us your feedback so that we can continue to have our programming uh, grow in the future. Uh, Colorado lawyers are gonna get a link. You get a CLE credit, so please be on the lookout for that, for your affidavit. I think the students are also getting credit um, for this public, uh, for, I'm not sure, what is it called, the, the pledge? The, the pledge, okay. You guys are gonna get credit for the pledge. So please do count this, right? Make sure that uh, you log that. Uh, I do wanna give a heads up. There is an event that's going on um, later this week. Uh, this is the launching the International Decade in Indigenous Languages. Um, this is happening here in the building October 20th to 23rd, starting at five o'clock on Thursday. Uh, so there are flyers in the back. Please do um, continue, right, continue the conversation and do uh, think about um, attending. Um, our uh, folks who are in person here, please do join us for the reception afterwards. We're gonna be in Betcher Hall. Uh, the reception goes till about 7.30. And if I could ask folks to maybe stay seated while we leave, I think we'll just, Justice Riley and I will leave and then everybody will happy to meet you at the reception afterwards. Um, thank you again, I really appreciate this. Uh, look forward to continuing this dynamic discussion with everyone at the reception and um, have a great evening.